Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody is still alive and well. Are you all enjoying the conference? Yeah, we have reached about the um, uh, final stage and uh, really there's a huge amount of uh, knowledge and experience that, that we have here in the panel. Um, and I would really love to have a, a direct question coming from the floor. Okay, and um, Lorraine is um, going to make it uh, a little bit more interesting. She's got a special gift from Canada. Um, maybe mm -hmm. I'll let her elaborate. This is not alcohol. It's not whiskey. It's not whiskey. So let can, me just start with that. Can we win this as well up here? Yeah. Or is that just for the ones This is there? Canadian maple syrup from uh, organic from maple trees in Canada. So it takes about 80 liters of sap from a maple tree to make about 1.5 liters of maple syrup. And they boil it for two days to create a bottle like this. This is called liquid gold in Quebec, which is where I'm from. So the best question we get, right? And the four judges are gonna vote and right. it can't be your question, Stefan. Don't. No? Um, the best question at the end of this session gets this bottle of maple syrup. Okay, the skin is in the game. Okay, I'm going, Hi, to, I'm going to start it first. I'm going to get uh, each one of them to maybe share um, in a sentence or, or two, okay, what they feel youth coaches, you know, from their uh, experience. I know Lorraine come from the coach education angle. You've got um, Sergio who have also gone into coach education, but has been a professional basketball player himself, has gone on to coaching, Team GB's uh, basketball women's team. Um, you've got um, another Olympic zero winning uh, coach here in the panel. And, uh, um, Sally, I forgot. Oh my gosh. You're not getting the maple syrup. You're talking about Stefan? <laughs> yes. Uh, and Stefan, yeah. So we've got a fantastic panel here, but I want them to sum up in one sentence or two what they feel, you know, going back, turning back the clock is critical for youth coaches um, to be able to do or to have uh, that sort of qualities or characteristics. Okay, so I'm going to start with maybe, yeah. Fresh. Um, the, one of the things we, we found out in swimming is that a, a, a great coach, it's quite often not what they actually give to the uh, athletes. I mean, it does matter, but a great coach is someone who engages the children, who does uh, capture them uh, every day, who makes them feel special. So it's that they feel every single session, my coach care today about me. And if you do this well, then you can do the specific things because the child will listen to you. They will care of what the coach thinks about. But if you just pay attention to maybe the, the best swimmers or the best gymnasts in the squad, if you only pay attention to the same people again and again, you will lose a lot of opportunities of making the difference to the other athletes. So to me, a great coach makes a difference. A great influencer is what you have to be, and great influencers, they change people's lives, and, and that's to me a great coach. Yeah. you? I mean, my experience is very similar. Um, as, as you were responding to the question there, my head went to this um, old adage of, People don't care how much you know until you, they know how much you care. And, and I think we keep coming back to that all the time, that I've known very technical coaches, very knowledgeable coaches that were completely unsuccessful unsuc because they couldn't connect with people and people wouldn't work for them, okay? At, at any level, from young kids to, to elite professional sports people. Um, and the other thing that was coming to my mind as I was listening to you, Stefan, um, a couple of years ago, we did some work in the Philippines, so kind of next door to you. Uh, <laughs> um, and there, uh, one of the guys, the local guys that was, um, we were doing 
some coach education for the coaches that work in the national um, schools for sport, for the talented young athletes. Um, and our local contact there um, was this very quiet, uh, very peaceful uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus priest. Okay? And we were having a conversation as to how to engage young people um, and how to help young people to, to excel, to be their best. Uh, and he said something to me that has stayed with me ever since. He said, uh, look, Sergio, you cannot force people into excellence. You have to love them into excellence. Once people feel cared for, loved for, uh, valued, they will do anything. And they will go through a, a wall um, to achieve something. Uh, and that's really stayed with me. And, you know, in my own coaching, I try that. I fail miserably sometimes. And I come across as a very... Uh, unloving coach every now and again, and I go, oh, how, why did you do that, okay? Because it is true, when you get to that point where the athlete feels like that, they fly, they absolutely fly, and, and, and you know, the best thing is, at that point, they kind, kind of don't even need you. They, because uh, I always say, as a good coach, you're trying to make yourself redundant, so they can fly solo. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll say it slightly differently, in, but saying the same thing. It's about belief. Every Ooh. child needs to know that you believe in them as individuals. They need to know that you believe that they can be better, that it's not just filling an hour of their day. Every child will feel whether you believe that or not whether they express it or not those are two different things they need to know you believe because that is part of the self-development of the individual at that stage that is critical to help them soar okay i'm going to open it up to the floor are you ready to throw a question for your maple syrup Do you need time to get I take it you, you've all had pancakes in the past, okay? That's what you need the syrup for. So go for the questions. Yep, Manwai? Uh, thank you, speakers. Ask a question. Um, so far this whole day, we've been talking about uh, coaching philosophies. And I suppose there are two other aspects which I'm sensitized to, uh, the technical skills, the scientific skills, and the, the other one is the, the pedagogy, instructional strategies, instructional skills. Now, of these three, um, what is the balance? What is the most critical? Or is it, is it a right question to ask even? I fear that we are going to forget about the art of coaching. So the sciences are incredibly important. The technical skills are incredibly important. I think, I think we continuously progress in the advancement and the development of those, but we cannot forget about the transformational leadership of the coach. So I'm a bit biased. I think, uh, everything needs to progress it's about the holistic development of the person and i worry sometimes that we're so based in the analytics and in the quantifiable that we forget about the other part which is the art and the development of the human being uh, i think as well so at the end as we probably all agree it's about people so we coach people uh, again and again and whatever message you have, you have to bring it across. So whether that's pedagogy, uh, probably somewhere, or whether we just call it simply coaching. Um, so, so it's incredible, incredibly important. Um, uh, and then with the modern children as well, adapting that to how they learn nowadays, there's a massive difference versus the visuals, the audio, uh, kinesthetic learning, and so on. Um, and we know these young kids come through with way more visual stimulation than we ever had. So does that mean that they are better at that skill by the moment they come to us? I believe yes. 
So we probably have to use more visuals today with these kids than we have used in the past. So that's somewhere an, an adaptation. So it's, we work with people, you have to get your message across that whatever you do, you see the change. Coaching is change. If you just talk and the kids don't do what you want them to do, you're not coaching. So to me, it, it, it's, it's all interlinked. Whatever your message is, whatever your skill is, technically, tactical, uh, energy system, whatever it is, you have to see the change. And, and that's to me, the, that's coaching. Yeah, I, I think you've said it, it's about people. Okay, so we are in the business of developing people and they happen to be athletes as well but they are people. Um, for me, the other big thing is the, um, or the, the, the other frontier, linking a little bit with the way younger generations learn, is the pedagogy, really. Because um, I think a lot of coaches are still stuck in a pedagogical paradigm that belongs to the past. It doesn't make it wrong, don't get me wrong, but there are other ways of learning. And, and, and they, all these different ways of learning of, or, or of teaching, are useful at different stages or in different situations. Um, so we, it's one of the things that we keep going back to this idea of there is not one size fits all and that the art of coaching is choosing the right strategy for the right person at the right moment and that you constantly have to be questioning yourself. So perhaps in coach education, we should be at helping coaches to be more reflective and be more attuned with am I doing the right thing now for this person? Uh, rather than just using blanket approaches, which I think is still the, the way some, some coaches operate. And it has to be much more, um, moment by moment, but really much more attuned to what do they need from me now. If I may can add something, Sergio just reminded me of one of the things we try to get across to the younger coaches is you, whatever experience level you have as a coach, don't assume that the person standing in, fr in front of you has the same and will understand you, culturally, uh, tactically, educationally, whatever level. So uh, nowadays I work with high performance coaches, I worked in Australia with world class coaches, but I work as well with developmental coaches and learn to swim coaches. So some of them just started their journey, so I have to find a different language for them. I have to be able to translate it. So as a coach, you have to be a great translator. It was most obvious when I worked with the Chinese swim team for a while. Um, my Chinese skill, unfortunately, non-existing. So I had to learn to translate everything in different way. So you try to explain a technique, swimming technique, highly complex, in another language. So I had to find ways. And that's again what coaching to me is about. But translate it to the experiment, uh, to the experience level, sorry, to the experience level of the person in front of you. A parent maybe brings that experience of having been a known athlete. That's a very different conversation than a young parent who was never an athlete and brings a child to you. So you, again, you have to be a translator on in, to, to their level, whatever it takes. I thought I would bring up uh, the Mentimeter questions earlier. In fact, that was the first question asked, and uh, you were asked to um, write down three qualities that you feel a good youth coach uh, should possess. And this comes from you guys, you know, as coaches. And it's interesting that uh, it's almost a question being played out at a diff from a different angle. Uh, and you are asking what sort of... Um, uh, knowledge would a coach need, but yet when you talk about what are the qualities and um, uh, the things that you would expect out of a good youth coach, a lot of what you're putting up is about coach-athlete relationship. And somehow within the coach education, that seems to be played down or missed out or not emphasized enough because we're assuming that everyone will be able to create that kind of a rapport, that kind of uh, ability to motivate uh, the athletes. Because I think a lot of them uh, would say that it's not just having a world-class program, it's making your athletes want to do that world-class uh, program that is the art of the coach. There's another um, 
in English, there's a, a, a phrase that says that you can take the horse to water, but you can make it drink it. And I like to modify that for coaches because mm -hmm. a lot of coaches um, hide behind that and say, oh, you can take the athlete to water, but you can make it drink it. But I say, well, maybe they don't want water. They want a milkshake, okay? <laughs> and, 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 and you keep taking them to water. Um, so for me, it's something that, what, what, do you, what do they need and what do they want? And, and can we find some kind of compromise sometimes? Because at the end of the day, it's, it's their sport. Um, yeah. I, I had a question for you guys. Um, because on the, um, can we put that, uh, the, uh, Mentee meter again? the cloud, uh, the world cloud back up again? Yeah. So I'm curious, um, and I think I'm really trying to win the uh, maple syrup here. Um, but I'm curious, the biggest word there is patience. But I'm curious to understand, what did you mean by that? So let me, let me put you in the picture. Actually, before I say anything, can anybody explain why they wrote down patience as a, a major quality of the youth coach? What was your thinking behind that? I think it's a great choice. So, but I just want to hear what the uh, rationale was for that. Thank you, sir, over there. Can we? Hello. Hi, I'm Piros. I'm a, I'm a professional rugby coach. So I coach from uh, primary school right up to colleges and clubs and so on for the past 21 years. And um, I think when we talk about patience, because we never know when a child or an athlete will develop. Yeah. You know, sometimes the skill set that we try to coach them or to teach them, they may not adopt it or embrace it at that point of time. But in time, they will have it or they will adorn it later on in life. Yeah. But throughout your teaching or throughout your coaching, you really need to, I think, to have patience, you need to have an, an understanding of what that particular individual needs, you know? Because in a team sport, it's very hard. Because you, in some sessions, you have about 30 players or 40 players, and you really have to divide your attention from one particular individual to the other. But going back to what you mentioned later on with regards to the art of coaching, so if you have the art of coaching as a coach, you are able to size up players, even within like 90 seconds when you have a training session, about even 30 to 40 players. But that, that patient will only come in if you have and make the effort to understand the particular athlete that you're teaching. You know? So it takes time sometimes. It may not develop now, but you need to work within the processes that you, have imp that, that, that you choose to implement. And then in time, it, it, it will come. But, the, the, but you, need, you, need to be a bit, you need to be a bit more patient with that as well. Good, because I mean, uh, the, the reason was I was asking because sometimes coaches refer to patients as we have to be patient because the kids are so difficult, okay? But the kids are just kids, okay? They are who they are, you know, and we keep going back to this idea. They don't want water, they want a milkshake, okay? Um, and, and, but what you're saying is really where I'm up as well, you know, the idea of learning takes time, development takes time, let's be patient. And one of the things that you were talking about, I, I call it individual readiness. Sometimes we want them to do things that they're not ready for. And we keep going, no, you need to try this, and they're not ready. And when they're ready, they try, they do it by themselves. They, I mean, I've, and I've seen that even at home with my little ones, <laughs> where all of a sudden, from one day to the next, all of a sudden, they, you know, he goes, oh, look at what he's doing now. And we've tried to do that for him so many times and he, and he wasn't interested and now he's doing it all the time by himself. It's, you need to be really attuned to that individual readiness. If they're not ready, it's like talking to a brick wall. And, and there's a physical and a mental readiness as two different layers and, um, and we never know when that happens. And it's one of the great Buddhism saying, so the teacher will appear once a student is ready. Uh, I think that translates well. Okay, we're going to go back to Slido, and there's a question that's asked uh, or directed to Stefan, although uh, it's interesting because uh, he's actually in charge of an individual sport, uh, so I'll probably direct it to both of them. Uh, the question is, how would you deal with a team sport as opposed to individual sport? Would you do anything different 
as to give all of them 100% attention. Yeah. Um, I actually used to play European handball as a child and then swimming and, and I kind of was co very competitive as, at both. I had to make up my own decision and for me it was simple because I always felt my teammates didn't put in as much as I did and didn't drive it and believe it as much and train as hard. So I went for swimming. Um, so I think the sport selects its own people. So whether it's a good question for me, I'm not sure. Um, if you look at the great teams in the world, uh, probably the All Blacks is one of the outstanding ones. The culture they have created. And if you, if you coach a team, um, look at that particular team, how they did it, and how they used the senior players of set the standards for the younger players. And it's not the coach that keeps on coming down on them all the time. It's really the senior team players who have these high expectations. However, you have to understand that if you create leadership within your team, you have to allow people to gain leadership. You can't just expect them to do the right thing. So early on, they need a lot of guidance. One thing we've done in uh, Queensland at some stage really well, we shifted a few young coaches, shifted the fo focus on female coaching. So most of you are, most of the sports have kind of half-half. But if I look around in this room, probably there's normally more male in the business of coaching, and particularly once it goes higher up, is it right? Probably not. It's right now the way it is. Uh, slowly, slowly changes. But if you, um, if you coach females and you don't often enough ask yourself how does a female brain think differently to a male brain, then, then you will miss out the dramatic opportunity of improving one particular group in your, in your uh, field. Um, now, again, back to coaching uh, teams. So um, you, at, at the end of the day, each individual, uh, each team uh, is... Um, is built out of individuals. So you have to improve the individuals and you have to improve the ability of bringing then these different in individuals together and create amazing opportunities for some leadership to come through and assist you with your job of guiding them. Sujo, you want to add on that? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm talking from, the, I'm, a, I'm a team coach, okay? I, I coach basketball and I've always felt that our biggest challenge was to coach the individual, because in a team sport, the individual tends to get lost in the team, both from technical perspective, but also as a human being, because there's another 14 or 16 souls in that dressing room. Um, and really over the last two or three years where, so I went from coaching uh, national teams to now coaching uh, U14 basketball. So I'm coaching 12 and 13 year olds. Uh, and really we've put a lot of emphasis over the last two or three years in trying to individualize it a bit more uh, from the technical and tactical training to the actual to the personal treatment. Uh, we sit down with them individually and their families quite a lot. Um, we help them develop their own training programs um, about, you know, like <laughs> you were funny before when you were talking about, uh, I was talking to someone, um, I think you in one of the, the lunch breaks around um, well, I try to give the athletes a lot of responsibility to develop their own programs, um, but it, it's alien to them because they are used to being told what to do all the time, okay? Um, we're trying to do a lot of that. We, we have um, chunks of sessions where for half an hour, they have to self-coach themselves. We're there, but they need to set up their own drills uh, individually or in groups of two or three, if two or three want to work on the same thing. Um, and this, that's a cultural shift because some of, even some of my coaches go to me and go, we're wasting half an hour. And I'm like, well, I don't think so. Because this is a long-term thing. Uh, and also some of the parents come to us and they go, they, they, they walk into the gym and they see us in a corner doing nothing other than observing, which is doing a lot, okay? Um, but they don't see us coaching because we delegate it completely on the kids to, to develop their own skills. And, and to develop their own understanding of what they need to work on. Um, but it works a treat. I mean, uh, after a little bit, the kids love it. And it's so beautiful to see them now when you say, okay, this is your 15, 20, half an hour self-training. Self just go, they do their stuff. 
if they have a question, they come to you and then they go again. I could show you videos that I've got of them, just you see 12 or 14 kids and I pan across the gym and they're all working on something different and they're all fully focused and there's no messing about it. And it wouldn't have happened two years ago and I wouldn't even have thought of doing it two years ago. Um, but it's working really well. A few interesting questions coming out. Um, I'm gonna try and push this one up and Yeah, so it, that's not the one. Okay, it's not showing on my iPad right, but it's showing correctly there. No, it's not. It's not refreshing. Could you refresh that? Okay, excellent. Just hang on. Keith? Yeah, and I thought that um, you could share, because three of you had the privilege to work at different positions or different stages, or, and you had the chance to work uh, either at the macro or the micro or directly dealing with the students or the athletes yourself. I'm just wondering, do you, uh, from your experience, do you have have you had any uh, particular, you found any particular strategy or element that has helped to strengthen that art of coaching that has helped a lot of these people here to continue to enjoy what they're doing and most important to continue to do the impactful work they have with the athletes themselves directly? Because I think without us, all the good things that are happening will not happen. Um, I'm a firm believer in learning and developing yourself from leaders outside of sport. So I, I, as, as I, I believe the ability to understand how other leaders affect change in inspiring human behavior, because that's what we're talking about is inspiring human behavior is how you can actually relate and develop and bring that back into sport. So that is the one thing I've practiced, I would say, for the last 10 years of my career, and it has significantly impacted, as CEO, it has significantly impacted how I can inspire human behavior. So I'll let uh, Sergio talk about that as well, but I, I firmly believe the clue to being better at what you do is actually to look outside your environment and find knowledge and expertise in other situations. It, it, it's interesting this because I'm gonna say uh, that I agree, I agree with that. And I, I personally do a lot of reading outside of sport. I'm, I'm, I'm an avid reader and I enjoy doing it. I don't do it because I want to get better. I, I enjoy doing it and as a result, I think I get better every day. Um, but for me, really, uh, the key is then connecting that to your own practice. And something that we, and again, as a coach educator uh, and as a coach, I try to do a lot of now is to spend time self-reflecting. Um, I think a lot of coaches are guilty of what I call traffic light reflection, which means I finish my session, I'm driving back home, and if I'm lucky enough that I get a couple of red lights and I have to stop, I will do some thinking about my coaching session. If I'm lucky and I get a green light all the way home, I'll get home and then life catches, on with, catches up with you and you gotta see the family and you gotta cook dinner and you gotta do something for work for the next day and you learn nothing from the session that you just did. But self-reflecting um, either individually or even better with your fellow coaches, either the guys that coach with you, I mean, I'm very lucky now, I've got two assistant coaches, um, that keep me on my toes all the time. And they are under the strict orders to the moment they see something that doesn't sit well with them, they go, why are you doing that? And that's just amazing, it's a great, and I know they're doing that because they want the best for everybody there, not because they want to catch me out or anything. And it's just, you know, you really need to be really, you need to apply the same level of discipline that you apply to your athletes to yourself. 
and the same level of demands. What did I do today? What could I have done better? What am I going to do tomorrow? It's that simple, but it works a trade. I think one of the biggest challenges we have as a society nowadays is busy life. Um, everyone is busy and the, the beep generation, so we're in the zone of thinking about something and then the telephone beeps, someone still loves me out there because a message from one social media comes through. Um, one of the things I try um, to teach uh, our coaches is to, be, to create some selfish creative time. Selfish in the sense, block out, uh, maybe try to do Friday morning from 10 till 12 o'clock at noon, um, a time frame where it's only about you dreaming about your future in, as a professional. Uh, so that means you will leave your computer away, you leave your phone off. Um, no one else except maybe not some other professionals are allowed to sit there with you. And not even in your head, in, on your mind, someone is allowed to enter it. And this society today makes this much more challenging. Creativity is highly linked to you having time. Uh, the drive home sometimes is those five minutes, unfortunately, that we only get time but it's not right. You have to plan for time where you're selfish about, uh, it's about your job, about your coaching, and about creativity. If you never do this, you will be challenged. Um, yeah. Okay, I like the next um, question. I'm gonna flag out from the Slido. Uh, Ms. Touching on uh, what else do you think can be done to decrease the culture of early specialization in Singapore? Uh, at least spe specialization in sport in Singapore. And the other thing I thought was interesting is um, that person put Sergio's name twice. Um, probably because Stefan wasn't, uh, he was very busy and he had to rush from his work to, uh, to join us uh, the second half, so we forgot completely about Stefan. Okay, so obviously he's addressed to all three of y'all. Um, who's going to start? Loring? Aside from the uh, talk that we already had about what can be done, I would suggest one of the greatest allies you have are the fellow coaches in the room. And so it is quite fascinating how coaches sometimes isolate themselves and don't create community of practices with other coaches from other sports. And so we've talked about government, we've talked about alignment, we've talked about educating parents. Um, but ultimately, at some point in time, a fast track, you know, I, I look at things and I think about things that can become fast trackers, you know, things that can significantly move the needle. And in fact, that's you. And you because you are the direct point of contact to the parent. And so how are you supporting yourself with strategies in dealing with the parent? And in fact, the answer is probably sitting right beside you in a shared conversation that will help you deal with that practice tomorrow with the conversation of uh, performance in the pool, for instance. Yeah, I think, I mean, the way, the way I've dealt with it really is through education and through showing people examples that you can still succeed without having to specialize at seven years of age. Um, Obviously, the, uh, the system around you can work against that. Uh, and I'm thinking, for example, in, in sports like, you know, I'm based in the UK, sports like golf or tennis or even football, where football academies are signing kids up at six years of age. And, and like you're saying, I mean, if you can show me someone in the room that can tell me, sh look, at, look at a group of six-year-olds and tell me he's going to be the next Ronaldo, that's that's just that's impossible. Um, it is. Um, so, you know, the, the the environment around you might not help, um, and that's where where you gotta be. Uh, it goes back to your philosophy. We've been talking about philosophy all day today, um, but it, it goes down to that. And and then you being willing to educate people around you and and fight that battle every day. Um, and and you know the same way that we talk about coaching one child at a time. Coach one parent, one parent at a time as well. Um, but, and, but it is, it is a, a long, long-term battle. It's not going to change overnight. Um, 
Um, uh, y y we got this beautiful word here, kiasu. <laughs> and kiasu for the panel means the fear of missing out. Yep. And so um, what that means, I, I reflect on it as a society, the amount of extra money Singapore pays nowadays uh, on tutoring has increased from $400 million to $3.2 billion over the last 10 years. So the trend this country is going, uh, it scares me to a certain degree because this is exactly the same. So the fear of missing out makes parents putting the kid already a bit earlier into this work and into specialization. And so there's a lot of work to do. I gave a parents talk last January here in Singapore uh, to swimmer parents, there are probably 150 parents or more there. And at the end of the talk, quite a few came up to me and said, we can really understand your message, but I just can't do it. And there was a, a common thing that I heard. Um, it, 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 as a society right now, we are challenged. And this is not a swimming, uh, sorry, a sports problem, I think. This is a challenge beyond. If you look at Finnish education system, they're highly successful. They're successful as South Korea and Singapore education-wise. But they do it in less hours. Again, question how? Why? What happens there? The teacher, for example, only is allowed to teach 600 hours a week. The Australian teacher teaches 1,000 hours a week. Uh, sorry, a week, a year. Um, so the 400 hours extra in Finland, they spend with their peers, CCE, like developing their own skills. Um, again, instead of just grinding harder and harder and harder, uh, sometimes we have to grind smarter. Uh, if you want to cut down a tree, we all know, spend a lot of time and sharpening the axe and then whack the tree. Uh, and don't do it with a blunt axe. And so how can we translate that for us as a profession? Uh, but it is a challenge. But it starts with the coaches here. Okay. Um, we've done some slido questions. Shall we open it up again to the floor? Anyone's got... Question that you want to ask to any of the panel? Yes, please. Okay. You want to flag that up? Yeah, sorry. My voice is very bad today. Um, I would like to ask what would you advise a youth coach whose team sport is actually not very popular in the country? Yeah, so it's a team sport and if, let's say it faces a shortage of athletes and it's self-funded. Yeah. You got that? It's right over there. What would you advise the coaches for the not very popular in the country? Is it a shortage of athletes? Yep. Okay. Send them to swimming. <laughs> um, I guess my first question to you is, do the athletes or the participants that you have in your sport love it? Okay. One starfish at a time. Um, we have the same issue in uh, Canada with ice hockey. I mean, it's blinding, you know. Uh, and so there, there will be certain cultural realities that I, that I think are... Um, you, you you must accept. Yeah, the spot I'm. You got swimming in the corner over here, but but <laughs> but I do believe if if the athletes that you have in the program, they love it and they believe it, that's that's step one. That's brilliant, and how you are able to create stories around that love for that sport is your next challenge. How do you translate the passion and the the, the positive experience and the outcome for that sport to the community in which the clubhouse is in, if it's a clubhouse, around the facility. How do you start slowly? You, you've got 27 kilometers from west to east. So start with a two kilometer concentric ring around there and engage the schools or in, engage the clubs and the parents and Get the word out. I, I, I feel like that is the best way for you is to translate the love that your athletes have for that sport into 
uh, other athletes or parents, and that might open the door for you. Ironically, or send them to ironically I'm referring to ice hockey in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just come in there? Because um, I feel your pain. <laughs> no, because, look, I coach basketball in the UK, right, in England. Football, rugby, cricket, swimming, athletics, basketball is right there. Cycling, basketball is right there. And they want to keep us right there, okay? Um, and I've been now in the country for nearly 20 years. Um, and I, I, please, can I take your details later? Because I'll send you, uh, we've just done some research um, in, in my basketball club as to, to understand this. You know, because our kids in our basketball club, they absolutely love it. They love the sport, and the sport is growing through word of mouth. Because, and, and particularly with the parents. The parents come to a basketball environment, which, by the way, one big plus in the UK is an indoor sport, okay? Because it doesn't stop raining the whole year, okay? Um, they come in there, they see the environment and what basketball, the basketball culture is about, which is miles away from the football culture, for example, uh, and they love it. And the kids become so engaged um, that that's what keeps them coming. They, you know, because even kids in growing, that grow up playing basketball in the UK don't grow up with dreams of you know, being in the NBA because, or being a professional because there's no professional leagues for basketball. There's, well, there is a professional league, but it's not really a professional league uh, you know, compared to other leagues in the world. Yeah, no, but don't they know? everybody knows. I've said this many, many times. <laughs> you don't have to edit the video. It's okay. Um, it is true. It's the love of the game, of the being there, and basketball is growing a lot um, because of that. Stefan, you want to add anything? No, okay. So Majority sport. <laughs> yeah. Swimming. We swim against the current. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take one more question. This is directed to Lorraine. If there are national sporting associations which are not aligned with the coaching association's belief, how do the Canadian coaching association body get to them? They have no option. That's the honest truth. It's a condition of funding from the federal government that they are part of the National Coaching Certification Program, as it is with LTAD. Love the question. Just a suggestion for the agencies. Um, so, so they have no choice. And in fact, in Canada, we have 66 sports who are part of the NCCP, and it's a requirement uh, to be eligible for a sport to be in our Canada Games. It's a requirement to be eligible for funding. It's a requirement uh, in many in, for provincial and federal funding. So, you, you know, I, I'm giving you an answer that's pretty easy. Um, it was hard when it was first done, but now we have new sports knocking on the door all the time. 